New World Order, and that's Adam Weiss up there. So, that's actually the emblem of the Priory of Scion. This is actually supposed to be a mythological secret society, but there's the Da Vinci Code. I, like I was saying, they turned this into a, a whole thing about Dan Brown. Here's something interesting. It's a pentacle. I think it's a tarot card. I don't know which one, but it's, it is a pentacle and the Star of David, the Seal of Solomon, whatever you want to call it. Okay, guys, what we're looking at here is a replica of the supposed Star of David. But what it really is, is the Seal of Solomon used in many magic rituals to summon demons. And we're going to take a look at what it is. As you can clearly see, it is two equilateral triangles. And what it means is, you take an equilateral triangle, which means it all has 60 degrees on each side. And that will equal 666. And then you add it with the triangle, inverted with another 60 degrees on all sides and what you get is 666 above as well as 666 below and you may not want to believe that or not but it's also a six-sided object a hexagram so if you want to think it's the Star of David or the Seal of Solomon just think about how Hitler made the Jews wear a six-pointed star during the Holocaust as well and keep in mind he read a lot of uh, Blavatsky as well as Alice Bailey Another important element to mention regarding the principle of duality depicted in the Baphomet image is the occultic saying, as above, so below. This very common occult expression means many things to different people. Some relate it to astrology, that the stars above are a reflection in the events on the earth. Some suggest that it means that God is like man and man is like God. It has also been suggested that these words are an expression of Satan's desire to establish his rule upon the earth as a reflection of his present rule among the fallen angels. Look at the similarities between Britney Spears' advert for her perfume and the great symbol of Solomon. The principle of duality is covertly being communicated. Once you know the reference, it isn't difficult to understand the esoteric message of this perfume campaign. At this point, it might be worth mentioning that in the message version of the Bible, the part of the Lord's Prayer where it says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, has been rather badly translated as, quote, as above, so below. The listener can make what they want of that information regarding the integrity of the message version of the Holy Bible. A common tribute to Baphomet is the horned hand sign, the esoteric meaning to this, put simply, is Hail Satan. Yes, rock stars do it, often with their tongues hanging out, but pretty much everyone and anyone in an influential position are doing it, whether they are collecting awards, caught by the paparazzi, performing on stage, at a political rally, or addressing the crowd. Yes, even the Pope does the horn hand sign. I'm just going to pause for a second as this begs the question, why is the Pope saying with his hands, Hail Satan? I don't want to upset people here, but the truth needs to be told, and by doing just a little research, it is easy to expose the Vatican as being heavily steeped with paganism and the occult. Let me be clear, I'm not saying that Catholics are Satanists just like not all churchgoers are Christian. On the contrary, there is no doubt that there are sincere Christians within the Catholic Church who love God. But what I am saying, for the record no less, is that the Vatican per se and the foundations of the Catholic Church as a whole have been merged with pagan traditions and has been riddled with occultic references and symbols from the beginning of its establishment. Anyway, let's move on. Okay, here is another popular hand sign. The exoteric meaning, the external or outward meaning being communicated by this hand sign is everything is okay. The esoteric meaning to this hand sign is the opposite. It is in fact the 666. The three fingers extended represent that there are three sixes. Let's see what else we got going on here. 
Now, did the Roman Empire never die? Were our founding fathers implementing worship of pagan Roman gods into Christianity? Are we all slaves to the god of the Roman Empire, Lucifer the Lightbearer? I already showed you that quote from the Satanic Bible. Now, I want you, what I want you to think about is how all our planets are named after Roman gods and goddesses. Venus, the goddess of love. Mars, the god of war. Pluto, uh, the guardian of hell. Uh, now, what's also interesting is Pluto's moon is called Charon, and Charon is the ferryman who carts you across the river Styx in Greek mythology into hell. In isn't that interesting? Now, I admit this sounds utterly preposterous, but let's review these simple facts. Like I was saying, most of it, all of our planets are named after planets, and the majority of our founding fathers were Freemasons. <laughs> Anyway, here's where I'm talking about the Roman god Lucifer. Alright, let's get back to Manly P. Hall. The same book. When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of the craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy. Let me see if I can get that quote up real quick. I got it marked, so... There we go. Here we go. It's from The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, so as you can see, I'm not making this stuff up. This is in actual Masonic texts. Now, let's get to some of the Albert Pike quotes, quotes about Lucifer. Albert Pike, a 33rd degree Freemason, in his book Morals and Dogma, writes, And works of Lucifer, Lucifer the Lightbearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness, Lucifer... The son of the morning, is it he who bears the light? Doubt it not. Let's check the page. Page 321 in Albert Pike, Morals and Dogma. As you can see, Morals and Dogma of the Ancient Scottish Rite. Here's a portrait of Albert Pike. There's his dual-headed phoenix eagle. Here's the Grand Commander. This was prepared for the Supreme Council of the 33rd Degree in actually Washington, D.C., so this is a good one. As you can see here, the Supreme Council, Mother Council of the World, Manly P. Hall talks about that. We're going to get to that too. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Let's talk, let's get to page 321 now. of Lucifer, Lucifer the light bearer, strange and mysterious name, Lucifer the son of the morning. So as you can see, he really does talk about this stuff. And, um, let's see where he talks about some more stuff. Pike also talks about how the true hidden secrets of masonry are kept from the lower ranks. He says that masonry, like all religions, all the mysteries conceal its secrets from all except the adepts and sages or the elect and use false explanations and misinterpretations of symbols to mislead those who deserve to be misled, to conceal the truth which it calls light from them. That's on page 105. Let's check that out. Just so you can see that he does say this stuff. All right, what else does he got to say? Well, on page 819, he also talks about mystical, a mystical energy force known to the ancients. There is, no, there is in nature one most potent force. This force was known to the ancients on page 734. He talks about, though masonry is identical with the ancient mysteries, it is so in this qualified sense that it presents but an imperfect image of their brilliancy. And even Pike can recognize the geniusness of the ancient Egyptians. 
But does that mean they worship worship Lucifer? Ah, uh, it sure looks like it to me. Now, it seems like they fell for the age-old lie of the devil that knowledge makes them a god. And obviously, through the way they speak, they feel entitled. This is the home of the largest and most powerful Masonic group in the country, the southern jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite. In the last suit, Professor Langdon comes face to face with this statue of Albert Pike, a man many consider the most famous person you've never heard of. Albert Pike is probably one of the least known but yet influential men of letters and writings that this country has ever known. Albert Pike was the Howard Stern, the shock jock of the Freemasonry. Albert Pike is probably one of the most misunderstood Freemasons in the world. He's been vilified, many, many times vilified, by individuals who are fundamentalists. What the novel doesn't mention is that Albert Pike is one of the men buried inside the temple. But why? Why would the Masons place the body of someone so vilified inside their temple? He certainly is a dark figure. I tend to refer to him as a dark Francis Bacon. He was an enormous man. He stood over six feet tall. He weighed over 200 pounds. He was a brilliant mathematician, linguist, jurist, orator, poet. And he set out these rather exotic rituals for advanced Freemasonry. Next to George Washington, Albert Pike is considered one of the most influential Masons of all time. During the Civil War, Pike was accused of war crimes while serving as a Brigadier General in the Confederate Army. But after the war, he was forgiven. President uh, Andrew Johnson granted him a full pardon in Washington, D.C. during a Masonic ritual ceremony. Pike turned around and made Andrew Johnson a high-ranking Mason in the Scottish Rite. The accusation is often made that it was because he was subservient to the Grand Commander that he granted the burden to uh, Pike. There were other rumors. As Brown mentions in his book, the Masons have been accused of many alleged conspiracies. One involved Pike acting as a leader of an underground Southern secessionist group known as the Knights of the Golden Circle. The idea of it was to oppose United States power and influence in North America by any means necessary by overthrowing the government in 1860, by breaking up the country in the Civil War. After the Civil War, other rumors linked Pike to an even more controversial group, the KKK. These individuals basically, in my opinion, were the greatest fabricators I've ever read. And I get very disturbed thinking about them because they made claims like Pike was a member, a founding member, created the KKK. Yes. Attacks on Pike continue even after his death. Author Dan Brown touches upon this when one of his characters describes the Masons as devil worshippers. What the tale doesn't address is that in 1894, a disgruntled former Mason, writing under the pseudonym Leo Taxer, depicted Pike and the Scottish Rite Freemasons as being in league with the devil. He found a young lady that said that she was like the, the harlot, the medium that the Masonic lodges were using in their diabolical sex orgies and black magic and black masses behind their closed doors. The Vatican bought into it and, and paid for it to be preached from the pulpit in, in all the churches. Taxa went so far as to claim Albert Pike believed that Lucifer is God. This was based on a quote from Pike's book Morals and Dogma, where Pike refers to Lucifer. Anti-Mason groups immediately seized on this as proof that Albert Pike was a Satanist. They basically said that when he mentioned Lucifer, he was a devil worshiper. He was a satanic devil worshiper, the biggest of them all. There were decrees written by the Pope at the time that specifically said he was a dangerous man. Masons, however, claimed that Pike was using the name Lucifer in its original Latin, meaning the bearer of light. He was not referring to Satan. He was referring to a star. He was referring to the star of Venus. This is not devil worship or Satan worship. What they mean by this was the light, the enlightenment. The enlightenment through logic, reason, and science. Leo Taxel eventually recanted, saying he made up everything, but the damage had been done. 
this day, televangelists like Pat Robertson love to pull pike out of their little bag of tools to show that the Freemasonry is part of a world conspiracy and they really worship the devil.